Hey folks, uh, I'm Anant. Uh, I'm Sharon. And uh, we're going to be talking about the Julia language and how we've been empowering innovation with the Julia language. Right. So, um, it's not so for those of you who don't know, Julia is a programming language. It's been around for a while now. We hit uh, 1.0 in um, a first table release in 2018, and it's been going strong since then. But uh, you might ask why, right? Why Julia? Why should I even bother knowing about another programming language when there's one coming out every, you know, every week or so? So the why is primarily because of the two language problem. This is one of the big motivations behind the Julia language itself. And some of you might have heard of this as Austerhout's uh, dichotomy as well. Essentially what the two language problem says is that you want to write code fast, but you want to also write code that is fast. Right? And there's a very subtle difference there. So when you're trying to prototype things, when you're, trying, when you're still in the research side of things and when you're still figuring things out, you want to be able to iterate quickly. Right? And this is not so easy when you're keen on performance. So you just offer a dynamic scripting language or something that makes it faster for you to reiterate and uh, build on your code. And once you've reached a point where you think it's satisfactory, you want to focus on performance. So because you know, this is code that's going to get, be used by critical applications in industry, wherever, right? And everyone wants fast code. And for that, you might end up having to write it in a faster language uh, that gives you more performance gains like C++ or uh, Fortran or whatever. So essentially what you end up doing is you end up writing the same uh, thing uh, twice over, and which is twice the headache, right? It's twice the pain. Which is where Julia comes in. Julia is a bit unique in that regard that it uh, tackles this issue head on. So it allows you to write uh, programs that are fast and that are also easily iterable, right? It's very easy to understand. It's basically like a scripting language itself. So some quick salient language features for you folks. It's a dynamic language. Uh, the primary programming paradigm that Julia uses is multiple dispatch. It uses parametric polymorphism in its type system. It has a JIT compiler, or as we in the community like to call it, a JAOT compiler, just a head of time compiler, because it compiles the code right before it's about to be executed. It's a garbage collector language, and it has an inbuilt package manager. So I, I can tell you for sure, having uh, dealt with Python and the, you know, the 100 package managers that it has, it is actually easier to use Python packages through Julia because of the extensive FFI support it has. So that's a quick uh, refresher or introduction to Julia itself for those of you who are not familiar. Yeah, so now I'll talk about the energy aspect of Julia. So it's not just that Julia is fast and easy to use, but it's also very energy efficient. So this is one of a kind of a benchmark done across all different functional languages, and Julia ranks second uh, right behind Rust. And you can see that uh, uh, this is what enables people to use this without feeling uh, guilty about uh, how much impact it has on the environment and stuff. Another, this is another uh, sort of uh, uh, benchmark uh, run by the Chapel language team. And here too you can see that it's not just Julia is efficient, but it's also super small in terms of code size and execution time. And you can see it in the bottom uh, corner of the uh, chart, which is always a good thing in this. So another great thing about Julia is that uh, since it's heavily used in a lot of numerical computation context, uh, GPU support is paramount. And we have native support for all sort of commonly used backends from NVIDIA, AMD, Intel, and Apple. And what this enables is that the Julia code which you write will just work on the GPU. You don't need to rewrite it using some fancy wrapper or some special operators and stuff. As long as your inputs are GPU arrays, your outputs will be GPU arrays and will, will be run uh, through the GPU. And it's not only that, but we also enable uh, for you to write your own custom kernels if required in a very uh, uh, like vendor abstract way. So you don't have to write it specifically for each vendor again and again. You can have one common place where you write it, uh, where you try to find commonalities and we do that for you. Right? In kernel abstractions.jl, you might want to check it out, uh, which enables you to write kernels for uh, like NVIDIA, AMD, Intel, and Apple all at the same time. And it supports all of them. So now Anand will talk a bit about the SIML universe. 
So, uh, Sharon mentioned uh, performance gains and how Julia is basically a GPU agnostic language. But where does this all manifest, right? Where does this, you know, where can you really see this come to fruition? The SIML universe is a great place for that. So what is SIML first and foremost? I recognize that most of you might have been uh, hearing SIML for the first time. So SIML is an ecosystem in Julia. It's one of the biggest ecosystems that we have and it's very extensive. Uh, the primary um, uh, concept behind SIML is that it's, it operates at the intersection of scientific learning and uh, scientific computing and machine learning. So essentially, um, it's, it's not just about creating machine learning models when you have a ton of data, right? You could have a billion row data set or whatever. But there are also fundamental equations and fundamental science that governs these uh, properties that this data describes, right? So essentially, you run thousands of experiments, you gather data from that, and it's not just you just throw it into a machine learning model and let linear algebra churn as much as it can till you get a reasonable amount. So when you start adding information about these models, this scientific information about the respective models that govern whatever experiments created this data, then you start to have real models that are properly representative of what you're trying to model. And that's when you start getting good predictions, right? So the SciML universe essentially enables this from end to end, right from uh, data processing methods for different types of data to different ways we can define these models and solve these models and such, right? So uh, the SciML ecosystem is a very unified, uh, it has a very unified interface. So you can essentially plug and play different parts of your models um, as you like, as long as the package is within the SciML ecosystem, it's guaranteed to work. It has a very modular design as well, as I just mentioned. Uh, and of course, there is always a focus on uh, reliability and performance gains that are to be observed with this. So, now that you know about SciML, where has this been applied? Because after all, the name of the talk is Empowering Innovation with Julia Language. We've just talked about ways with which we can empower, but have we, has this actually been uh, put to test at scale, right? Has this um, been applied in real world scenarios? And of course it has. So the first, uh, so we're gonna walk through a few case studies. Uh, there are a lot more case studies that you can find um, on Julia Lang's discourse, on Julia Hub's case studies uh, section. But we're gonna, we've handpicked a few that we think might be uh, very interesting to the folks here. We're gonna go through those. So the first is Celeste, and the QR code right there is for the JuliaCon talk that covers Celeste. So Celeste is essentially a model for cataloging the universe. This was a research collaboration done by UC Berkeley, uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, um, NSCRC, uh, Intel, MIT, and Julia Hub. Right? So Celeste was supposed to be a model that helps you catalog the universe itself. This proved that petascale parallel computing uh, was possible with Julia. Uh, we observed a peak performance of 1.54 petaflops using 1.3 million threads on uh, 9,300 KNL nodes of a, a, the Cori supercomputer. Right? And we were able to uh, produce 188 million astronomical objects in just 14.6 minutes. So this is uh, state-of-the-art performance. And this was all done back in 2017. And if you remember, I mentioned that Julia uh, had its first stable release only in 2018. So this is much before Julia has a lot of the performance gains it has right now. The next thing that I'd like to talk about is CLIMA. CLIMA is the Climate Modeling Alliance. It's a coalition of engineers, applied mathematicians, and climate scientists uh, from MIT, Caltech, and NASA's uh, Jet Propulsion Labs. So uh, CLIMA essentially performs research on climate science. CLIMA uh, does a lot of modeling about climate as well. So they have earth system models that are written entirely in Julia. Uh, their latest earth system model is called CLIMA Core, whose uh, core is entirely written in Julia. They have fluid dynamics models uh, for modeling oceans and the way uh, temperatures in oceans uh, raise and fall and things like that. It's called Oceanigans for people who want to check it out. They have atmospheric circulation models like ClimaAtmos.jl and most of Clima's uh, repositories, if you check them out on the GitHub uh, by scanning the QR, you'll see that they're all written in Julia and it's for a reason, right? When you're modeling at this scale, you, you simply can't ignore the performance gains and the problems that Julia solves. Yeah, so now I'll talk about another case study. You might have all seen this image of a black hole. This was probably the first uh, image for a black hole. Uh, and uh, this was by, uh, and this picture of Katie Bauman, who was one of the lead developers of the algorithm which was used for this, is very famous, where she is uh, there with like, you know, like, like 10, 20, I don't know how many hard disks filled with all the data required to process that image, one single image. 
And you can imagine the kind of computational requirements that must have had. And we recently had uh, a Julicon talk on this too, where uh, another member from the team uh, came back to it, used Julia, and it went down from, uh, the compute time went down from one week on a cluster to one hour on one CPU. And uh, you can see the kind of difference in how much it will make your scientists more efficient, right? Uh, it's it's uh, orders of magnitude of speed up, right? And you can find more about this on the QR code. Since we're short on time, I'll uh, yeah quickly go through this. Another example of this is probably where NASA used uh, Julia to speed up their baseline model for the Rickersat uh, by 15,000. And uh, this is uh, all thanks to the power of SciML, the scientific machine learning ecosystem built using Julia. And you can find more information on that in the QR code. So another example here, uh, Unfortunately, we don't have access to video. There was a cool visualization. But another example of this, which we do in-house at Julia Hub, where we use Julia to accelerate uh, uh, problems which customers are facing. Uh, in this case, it was actually the Williams Racing. They had a model for their F1 car. And uh, they, it was you know, predicting the sensor values which you gather during, test, uh, uh, during testing during race time. right? So this is using physically informed machine learning where you basically combine a bunch of differential equations with uh, data and uh, try to have a model which is grounded with phys uh, physical realities, right? And we were able to uh, offer a much more smoother and accurate results. And uh, these were uh, also accurate, as accurate as uh, it can get, uh, especially considering the sensor uh, inaccuracies. So some of cool applications include Zipline's drone delivery service in Africa uh, to supply medical supplies. It was using Julia. Uh, and a few more of the things mentioned here. Uh, now Anand might want to talk about. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, we've clearly evangelized Julia a lot. Uh, I was here at the previous India Force as well, and I've uh, successfully evangelized that to a lot of people as well. So we'd love to see more people uh, using Julia, getting started with Julia. Uh, just head on over to the first QR code to julialang.org. You can see uh, whatever links you want there. You can see links to download Julia, how you can get started with interacting with the community. You can also see, uh, if you're looking to get your hands dirty, you can al there's also a GSOC, JSOC section on there in which you can see projects that mentors have proposed that you can take up uh, and do Julia. If you have compute restrictions, which I recognize that a lot of people do, uh, we at Julia Hub have a free tier. Uh, the, our Julia Hub uh, offering is free for academics and students. So uh, please feel free to use it. Uh, feel free to use the free tier to get access to compute that you wouldn't normally have access to and try out Julia. Yeah, just to be clear, the Julia as a language is completely open source and uh, anyone can use it, install it on their machine and use it. Uh, Julia Hub just provides a cloud interface uh, to make those computations massively parallel. Thank you. Yeah, that's Any okay. questions? No question. Yeah. So you're, you're using a GIT compiler, right? Yeah. So how are you achieving the performance of uh, something like a statically compiled language like C? Right? Was it a conscious choice? So um, it's, it's a lot to do with the fact that Julia itself is written in Julia itself. So there's very little overhead. And Julia basically sits at one level above LLVM itself. So our compiler is just that good. It's simply to put it. And also, Julia has great FFI as well. So even if you were to call uh, Julia function through C or call the function uh, directly uh, through C, you would uh, observe more or less similar performance. Uh, what do you mean by? Yeah. So sometimes you need to use this. Uh, I, I haven't necessarily seen people doing this for performance gains. But I have seen people doing this because they have no other choice because uh, something in Python has a very well-established ecosystem, but that's not just not there yet in Julia or something. So you have to use FFI. Or there's one specific method that uh, you know some other you know language ecosystem has that you really just need to use. Yeah, it also enables kind of soft launching Julia usage where you don't want to completely migrate to Julia. You want to do it step by step. And uh, this sort of... Uh, 
uh, interoperability enables that. Uh, we have one more question. Can we take that? So I think that's a bit of a loaded question, actually, <laughs> because Python's been around for quite some time now. But I think uh, in terms of ecosystem, Julia's uh, SciML ecosystem is probably our strongest bet. We have, I, I think we have more things that, than any other ecosystem out there in terms of SciML. And most of the other ecosystems are still maturing. So in the sense that uh, things like web development and stuff is, I wouldn't say it's in its early stages, it's still very well up in there, but I'd say uh, compared to Python, probably it's th there's still ways to go, but we'll get there hopefully soon. Yeah. So uh, time's up. So we'll be around. We also have other colleagues from Julia Hub sitting <laughs> in the fifth row. If you guys want to chat about Julia or just getting started or whatever.